in the summer of 2019, we got a tip, an alert that there were these um, objects on the or in the attic of this former pharmacy. And uh, we sent some people to check it out, and it was uh, pretty surprising what we what we saw. They were these spools of prescriptions uh, from this pharmacy. Right now, we think they date from the 1920s to the 1940s. There's about 30 plus of these quite long spools. And in each one of them, there could be thousands of prescriptions. We just don't even know yet what they can tell us about the health of Philadelphia, the health in that time period, um, who the pharmacy was serving, their clientele. There's all sorts of nuances that can give us this very intimate snapshot into the public health in that time period and in that location that is absolutely amazing. And I'm very excited to be able to delve deeper into that and to have access to that information. But we're going to need CCHA's help in order to do that because we have to very carefully figure out how to get these prescriptions off the spool, how to preserve that information uh, via digitization, how to preserve the, the slips if possible, and then you know how to properly store and manage that information. So the stack that I started working on first was from 1937. That means that it was in that attic untouched for 80 years. This is a really unusual situation for paper to come into our lab. Usually papers have been handled and used and they have a lot of that effect that you can see that history in them. The history that we were seeing in this stack of papers was a history of neglect in a way because all of the papers were very tightly stacked on the spindle, the interiors of them were almost completely untouched and looked really pristine. There was no physical damage, no air, no grime was getting in there. The edges, on the other hand, were incredibly fragile because they had been exposed for so many years. They were curling. They had a lot of oxidation due to the acidity of the paper and the oxygen reacting from the air. And they were also filthy. The grime that we see on paper can be from many causes. A lot of it comes transferred from your hands as you're handling it. Or we might see a loose layer of dust, which in a normal household environment, dust usually comes from uh, outside particles and human skin cells. The dust that we saw on the shawarma instead was really black and very, very fine and loosely bound. Physically, the papers were in really good condition on the interior. So they were not handled a lot before they were spindled. So there wasn't a lot of tears prior to them going on. Once they ended up inside the stack, the exposed corners did have a little bit of damage just from handling. And as they got brittle and they curled and folded, some of the corners cracked a little bit but the interiors remained really sturdy. So we're working in the fume hood in order to prevent spreading any of the dust or any spores or viruses that might be still in these papers as we clean. While I'm in here, I'm doing the surface cleaning first, which before I introduce any moisture, I want to get off as much loose grime as I can to avoid it becoming embedded into the paper. The grime is coming off really easily because this is not an ordinary grime that we might see on most people's personal papers, where when you're handling them, the oils of your fingers will grind in and make the dirt stick much more tightly because it's been handled and physically pressed into the paper. In this case, the only thing that is making these papers dirty is tiny particles in the air which is generally a really dark black, we think that it would be probably the soot from either coal or oil heating in the building that was depositing in a very, very loose layer just on the outer edges. So I also do not see very much grime at all on the interior. When I'm doing the surface cleaning, it just takes a very, very gentle tap to bring off a huge amount of the grime. And so it's really, really satisfying to clean these up. As I'm working, the corners are also often curled or broken or creased. And this is something where I'll smooth them out and lay them down with a little bit of introduced moisture. And it really takes very little to relax. There's been some areas where the ink has bled from water exposure in the past. 
So I know I do have to be really careful about introducing too much moisture because I don't want to disrupt any of the information. But a really gentle mist, a slight humidification is often enough to smooth out a curled part. If there's a crease, I'm often reinforcing it with a layer of remoistenable tissue, which is activated either with a mist of water or with a 50-50 solution of water and ethanol. And so the moisture in the mend also helps to restore the flatness of the paper and let it be held flat and smooth for the future. When we took the spindle apart, we realized that the pages had not just been stuck onto a spike the way I had sort of imagined that they would be pierced by the spike. Actually, there was a hole punch in each sheet that had been neatly punched out and then the spindle was threaded through that hole. And unexpectedly, in many cases, the little circle was still present and it would often be hanging loose or missing almost altogether. Um, this little hanging chad sometimes was right through information as well. And so whenever we could, I would just tacked the chads back here with a little bit of a remorseable tissue. In this case, there's no information on the circle, but you can see it's a quarter inch circle. There could definitely be several letters on here. And so when we can, we're putting it back to keep that information, but it's still quite clear that it had been punched out. And so I think there's, you can see the evidence of its history in the sheet, even when it has been mended. Once the sheet has been stabilized, we will be giving it to the imaging department and they will be making digital captures of all of the sheets, including when there's information on the verso. Usually it would just be saying that the prescription had been filled. When we image it, we can do text recognition captures on the printed text. Our, our computer software is not going to be able to interpret these doctors' handwriting, but it will capture all of the information about the office and anything that's in a printed format. So that can be attached to the file as well. And some of the information is there. It's really going to take humans to come along and read all of the handwritten information. At this point, I mean, like the, the amount, not only is the amount of information daunting. It's it's thinking about it and what we have. I also feel very responsible for it. Like we, not only do we have to scan it, save it, get the hand rating uh, transcribed, but then we have to put all that data in a safe and accessible place. And that's going to be a challenge because we're going to be talking about probably terabytes of, of data and it's, it's expensive and it's, in, but it's also very important that we make these open access um, and that's something we haven't even begun to examine yet. And I think it's going to take a lot of work. But right now, we're just trying to save the shawarma, preserve it, get the information um, properly preserved and properly uh, stored. And after that, it's just a matter of figuring out all the questions it could potentially uh, ask or answer. I think what's going to happen is it's going to answer a lot of questions and then cause us to think about lots more questions. And I'm excited about that because being able to have access to this glimpse into public health is something that I never thought we were going to have. And um, I do feel very responsible to make sure we take care of the information and make it accessible any way we can.